I'm joined today by Jean Traunstein, author of Boy with a Knife, a story of murder, remorse, and a prisoner's fight for justice. Uh, this is such an interesting book. And Jean, you tell a number of stories about juvenile incarceration, and you address some of the broader issues through some specific stories. Let's start for people who may not know that much generally about uh, juvenile prison, jail, the trying of uh, juveniles as adults. Generally speaking, does the U.S. tend to uh, try more or fewer juveniles as adults than do other countries? In other words, is this a particular problem in the United States? Uh, first of all, thanks for having me, David. And uh, yes, absolutely, we are an outlier in terms of in terms of the quote unquote civilized world. If you look at many countries, they have they do have some juvenile prisons, but people are kept with kids their own age. They're kept in conditions that don't involve solitary. They're kept in conditions that where they don't feel frightened by older men or women in some cases. And this is something that developed, you know, I mean, many years ago, we, when we had a case, everybody was tried as an adult. Then we developed the juvenile court, which was specifically to treat kids as kids. Then when this whole quote unquote super predator rash came into being, which was around the 1990s. And during the time of the person I write the book about when he was sentenced, uh, there were harsher penalties created for kids because people were afraid and the code was black kids really that they were going to continue raping, pillaging, plundering, murdering, and crime was going to rise. And so states changed their laws. That's how we got to be in a position where every single day, 200,000 kids are processed through the adult criminal system, whether they are tried, sentenced, uh, served time in, used to be 250,000 when I started the book, but crime has gone down. But our harsh penalties have not changed as much as they need to. So there are so, people who can sort of disagree subjectively about uh, particular crimes committed by a 16 versus a 17 versus an eight year old. There, people can have sort of have have differing opinions. But what we can't really disagree with is the data around some of these decisions that are made. And to sort of get us into that, I'd love for you to talk about if we look at the recidivism rate of juveniles sentenced as adults compared to re the recidivism rates of juveniles sentenced as juveniles. What does that data look like? Well, there has been several studies done, and in every single study, even when crimes were matched exactly with what whether they were in the adult and the juvenile facility, um, the stats are pretty staggering um, in terms of kids who get out of juvenile facilities doing, I think it's twice as, two times better in some cases uh, with some crimes that may not be, but the interesting thing is that it's substantially better and we don't and these are studies that have been done several studies that have been done and we don't really pay attention to that in my opinion because we are busy thinking that the juvenile system is quote a cakewalk that people aren't going to get enough punishment there and that's really where we're come from as a country where some countries come for Let's take care of all the harm that's been done, take care of all our kids and help them come back as fully functioning people into society rather than uh, with the handicaps that um, they have after they get put in with adults. So the recidivism is definitely worse. What are some of the reasons that juveniles refuse plea bargains at higher rates than adults do? Well, this goes to an interesting idea that I, I thought about this a lot at, uh, when I was 16. And I'm, and I'm imagining if you think when you were 16, uh, what you thought was going to happen for the rest of your life. 
you saw the world as a road stretched out in front of you. I mean, many people don't, but I think a lot of people do. And Carter and under other many other kids, when they're often offered something, and in this case, since Carter was going to get a life sentence, or at least he, they were asking for a life sentence. Right. And Carter, for asked, people who don't know, is this is one of the stories you tell in the book for people who just to, to make that right. clear. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, but the particular case that I'm talking about, he and many cases when they're when kids are going to get life sentences, uh, the idea that they even if they were going to get parole in 15, 20, 30 years, the idea of a life sentence is ridiculous. So if someone to them, so if someone offers them, let's say 10 or 15 years, and in Carter's case, it would have been 15 years. That's as long as he's lived. He can't see that as anything but as long as I've lived. So many kids are in that situation. And because when you have a lawyer, you have your lawyer if you're a kid. Your parents aren't employing the lawyer. It's your lawyer. You have to make the decision. And there are a lot of times that the, per the parents can be in the room, but it's the decision of the person who is accused. Are there uh, or, or what are the dangers of putting juveniles in adult prison? Well, it varies from state to state. Um, one thing that states do, they now we have this rape elimination act across the country. And so that means that you are no longer allowed to house juveniles within a certain amount of sight and sound from adults. That's not being followed in every state, and it's and people have to pay money if it's not followed, but they're still not following it. But to avoid that, some states put kids in solitary. Um, many states allow people to be in juvenile facilities until they're uh, the age of adulthood in that state, which can vary from 17 to 18 in New York. As we know, it's still 16. North Carolina, it's still 16. So in order to protect kids, the they have to have um, they have to have some restriction from adults. But what happens is they don't have a lot of restrictions from adults. And there's bullying, there's fear, there's intimidation, there's um, isolation is enormous. Isolation from family. I mean, imagine being a kid, sixteen, no matter what you've done, away from your family, um, and. Just the idea of solitary, which we're really trying to stop in this country, but we have not stopped. We have stopped it. Obama asked for it to stop on the federal level, but that doesn't mean state prisons have stopped solitary. Now, in Massachusetts, where I live, we don't have solitary for kids, but they have things called room consignment. Um, you know, they get away, they get around these things to some degree, but in an adult facility, um, if you're a kid, and even, I, to me, a kid is still, I, I still think of a kid as 18. Um, if you're 18, you know, all bets are off. Gene, I want to switch gears a little bit uh, in the last bit of time we have left here and talk about something that is increasingly in the news. There is more and more discussion of banning prospective employers from asking mm -hmm. about criminal records. And my question is more of a of sort of a practical logistical one. If your employer is going to run a background check, does it matter if you can't ask on the application? Have you been convicted of a felony? W would that not show up on the background check anyway? This is something that people have different opinions about. I will give you what I heard from the person, the young man who I do focus my book around. Uh, when he got out of prison, he had many jobs that would not allow him to have the job if he filled out a form saying that he had had some, he had been, you know, essentially in his case, he had murdered somebody in prison. So, but it, it, even with a low level offense, it shows up and people will stop in their tracks and not ask you back for an interview or, or not even ask you for an interview. The problem comes when, even if you don't have to fill that out on the application the first time, is that at the interview stage, people will ask you about what your history is. Now, to me, that's better than screening you out at the 
uh, where you don't even know a person's stage. It's better because you at least get a chance to see a person sitting in a room talking to you about their experience. But the real key is how do we deal with uh, the fact that what we're finding is people of color are often dismissed in favor of white candidates when that happens. Um, there's an assumption if I don't know your background, um, I'm going to assume you have a crime. There are a lot of things that employers do that we don't, we can't control, no matter whether we have the box or not. So I think it's a step forward, but it's not a major step forward, in my opinion. I'll tell you once again, the book is Boy with a Knife, a story of murder, remorse and a prisoner's fight for justice. We've been speaking with the book's author, Jean Traunstein. Jean, thanks so much for talking to us about this today. Thank you.